This is CBC Here and Now. Police investigate whether an impaired driver was responsible for a fatal crash this weekend. Two died in a head-on collision. The number you have reached has been disconnected. So that's the message we received. Some West Coast fire departments feel cut off as Bell pulls the plug on pagers. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Carolyn Stokes. And I'm Peter Cowan. Police are releasing new details tonight after a fatal crash yesterday in central Newfoundland. Two people from Lewisport were killed in a collision on the Trans-Canada Highway. A 65-year-old man and a 63-year-old woman were pronounced dead on the scene. Here and Now's Garrett Berry has been looking into this story and he joins us live. Garrett, what have we learned about this crash? Well, just this afternoon, police told us that they are investigating whether impaired driving is a factor in this accident. They said they've taken the blood sample from a 20-year-old man and sent it for analysis. That man was a driver in one of the two vehicles involved in this crash. You can still see the burn marks, in fact, on the Trans-Canada Highway near Gander today. That is where a vehicle caught fire in the crash. Police say a truck and an SUV collided head-on. They got the call at about 4 a.m. At that time, two occupants of the SUV were already pronounced dead. That was the 65-year-old man and the 63-year-old woman, both from Lewisport. Police say the two other passengers of the SUV were brought to hospital. They have serious injuries. The driver of the pickup truck was also brought to hospital. The highway was closed around this location yesterday morning as police and the fire department worked at the scene. An RCMP traffic investigator was brought in and their investigation is ongoing. I can also tell you that I spoke to uh, Betty Clark, the mayor of Lewisport today. Uh, she said it's really too soon to comment or really talk in any depth about this incident, but she said it was a tragic day, a really sad day for her close and well-knit community. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Garrett Berry in Gander. Well, now to the west coast of the island where several volunteer fire departments have been left hanging when it comes to emergency dispatch. That's because Bell Alliant pulled the plug on its pager service. Here and Now's Lindsay Bird has that story. Sorry, the number you have reached has been disconnected. So that's the message we received. That message means these pagers at the Steady Brook Little Rapids Fire Department are pretty useless. They were the firefighter's dispatch system for emergencies until June 30th, when Bell Alliant ended its pager service for all of Atlantic Canada, Quebec and Ontario. Bell said it told customers back in November that was happening, but several West Coast fire departments didn't get a heads up. Now what we had to do, we had to go find the saying, Steady Brook Little Rapids is now using an app to alert them to emergencies. It works, but not half as fast as the pagers did. Whoever's on call to receive that message for the weekend, then they have to stop and open up the app, type in a text message because we can no longer send a voice message. So it does add delay and seconds matter in emergency services. Steady Brook is lucky. It has cell service. But large parts of the Bay of Islands do not, and that has fire chiefs in those communities concerned. The town of Meadows went with a local pager service after it lost Bell, but its fire chief says coverage is spotty and calls could get lost. And it feels like the department's dispatch capabilities have gone back in time. Right now, uh, we're basically gone back 40 years. Like, it's, it's crazy. Back in Steady Brook, Sean Lehman wants to see a better system come into being one province-wide emergency dispatch system, so it's not up to individual fire departments to scramble and get something in place. I mean, Nova Scotia has a radio communications system that they, each department can talk to the other department from the New Brunswick border right to uh, you know, North Sydney. So it's, it's out there, the technology is there. That sort of system would be the provincial government's responsibility, but right now all the province is saying is that it's working with the departments affected by the loss of Bell's pagers to ensure the next emergency is covered. Lindsay Bird, CBC News, Cornerbrook. Only about 230. That's relatively low in this kind of a community, uh, just getting started. 
People in CVS were treated to a great show from the sky over the weekend. The Canadian Armed Forces Skyhawks parachute team made a special appearance, putting on quite the show on Saturday. Here and now's Adam Walsh tagged along, and we'll bring you that story in just a few minutes. Well, it's a gorgeous day to be by the ocean. Yes, and unfortunately, because they wouldn't let all of us go out to Cape Spear tonight, <laughs> Ashley is the only lucky one. They don't let us do the news outside, no. even on nice days. No, unfortunately. So, uh, <laughs> Ashley, are you seeing any whales out there tonight? Uh, not yet. I haven't seen anything. Uh, I'm keeping my eye out, though, but I've been kind of paying attention to uh, what's happening with the weather as we speak. And it is an absolutely gorgeous day. A number of areas seeing temperatures in the mid 20s across the board. Now, as we head through the next couple of days, some of this heat will stick around. We'll have all those details coming up. Labrador is getting its first look at a new vessel that will service the north coast today. The Kamatik, Kamatik uh, W arrived in port in Happy Valley Goose Bay and the ship is bustling with last minute preparations. Here now's Jacob Barker will be riding along for the inaugural voyage up the coast and got to have an early peek at the vessel. And I think we're having some technical difficulties bringing you that story. So I think we'll hold off for now and continue on. Okay, here we go. I think, I think we're ready now. <sighs> well, here she is, the Comatic W. It arrived a little bit late, but it's about to head out servicing Labrador's north coast. It arrived yesterday evening and cars have been trickling down all through the day today and yesterday to get a look. The ramp came down for the very first time on Labrador soil today. If we go on the coast, we'll use the boat. What do you think about having the, the possibility of rolling on, rolling off? Oh, that's good. You go and take your machine with you. Yeah. You know, that's, that's different. Looks like a a comic anyway, when I look at it. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like a big comic. A big comic, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the ship arrived later than expected. It was overseas getting some last minute renovations done. That work can be seen here in the suites. Some rooms will have bathrooms, others will have to share. And while they're tight, there's still space for socializing. 120 vehicles can come aboard along with spots for eight trailers. More if there are fewer vehicles. And the performance in the ice is something they will be watching closely. Here's a glimpse at the steel hull. Ice class 1A, a strong class, but it still may need help at certain times of year. November and December, there's the, the ice. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. But for, 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 uh, for last next year, June, might be uh, too much ice. Another concern was ramping on and off the docks and communities. With the longer ramp on this vessel and the work they're doing on the wharf in the communities, the company hopes to alleviate those concerns. Regular, we got a new one that's finished. Yeah. McCormick is uh, leaving tomorrow. Yeah. And we got two more to do it. There's Nain and uh, Nashashish. So it'll be uh, for the end of next week. Labrador Marine says a lot of work has been going towards getting this service up and running. They're aiming to please. It's revolutionary with respect to the service that we're going to have on the Labrador coast. I mean, it, it's a, it transcends uh, basically the way uh, the, the way people and, and goods have been moved on the coast. So it's going to be very functional with respect to the general public and freight as well. Well, we got the tour today, but there's still a lot to say about this new vessel and the new service. That's why tomorrow I'll be jumping aboard as it pushes off for the first time from here in Happy Valley Goose Bay, port to Nain. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Happy Valley Goose Bay. One of the province's newest long-term care centers had its Pride Week festivities today. Here now, Cecil Hare dropped by for the flag-raising ceremony and parade, events that have quickly turned into an annual tradition. 
The day was hot and sunny, perfect for a parade once around the building. A big crowd turned out too, including staff, volunteers, residents, and their loved ones for the kickoff to Pride Week activities at Pleasant View Towers. Pride parades and celebrations here have been around since the building opened five years ago. This year, there's a movie night, social events, prizes, and residents will get a performance this week from the St. John's Gay Men's Chorus. Well, I think it's wonderful for them. Yes, it is. It's a good thing. Those with loved ones at the center say there's a vibrant and healthy and active LGBTQ plus community at Pleasant View. Elizabeth Holloway says times have changed and remembers when events like these weren't held, weren't tolerated. The culture at Pleasant View, she says, led her there. The reason I decided to move in here was because uh, of the fact that they celebrate Pride Day. And uh, I said, well, where else would I want to live? Uh, so this is why you came here? Yes. Uh, it weighed that much in your decision? Oh, big time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I lived a long time, but people tell me I was living wrong. So I thought I'd tell them I was going to go somewhere where I was living right. <laughs> At the center, there's a diversity and inclusion committee that does the pride organizing. Judy O'Keefe says it's important the word gets out to the LBGTQ plus community that they are not only accepted and respected, they are celebrated. And it's so important because, Active. especially for long-term care, because we, we often don't think about diversity in long-term care, and we don't think about anybody who may be LGBTQ in long-term care. So it's so important for us to be able to have these events so people know that it's a safe place, it's an accepting place, and that we're here to celebrate with them. O'Keefe says pride celebrations like these are growing in popularity too. At least six other long-term care centers under Eastern Health are holding pride events this week. Cease Hair, CBC News, St. John's. Well, police are investigating what appears to be a bizarre break-in attempt early yesterday morning. A massive glass window at a St. John's drugstore was destroyed, leaving behind a big mess. It happened around 5 a.m. at the Shoppers Drug Mart on Torbay Road. The front window was smashed and the parking lot was littered with glass and twisted metal. Police didn't provide any information on what was used to smash the entrance of the building and haven't said whether anyone was hurt. The RNC is reviewing surveillance footage from the scene and they're also looking for any dash cam or CCTV footage of the incident. After this weekend, many of us know what an afternoon in the garden can do for our mental health. Today, a new kind of therapy program at Stella Circle that's built around activities like gardening got a big boost. Here now, Zach Gowdy has more. Many of us do things with our hands to find peace in our minds. Some people play music. For others, it's drawing or painting. Maybe for you, it's spending time with animals or working in the garden. Now Stella's Circle is turning those hobbies into healing. So expressive therapies is all about using creative expression to help people. And so you're familiar with traditional talk therapy where people would talk to somebody about maybe their feelings or issues that they have ongoing. And using expressive therapies, things like horticultural therapy, yoga, um, equine therapy, it's another way for people to express themselves and maybe to overcome some issues that they might be facing. This morning, Fortis donated $50,000 to the Expressive Therapy Program. The donation brings Stella's Circle halfway to its million-dollar fundraising goal. We grow lettuce, pumpkin, blueberries, onion, parsley. I think we have some broccoli getting ready to go. Jeff Dwyer has been doing horticultural therapy for the past few months, and it's helping him grow as a person. Uh, it's helped me because it's taught me like a lot about staying calm and not overreacting when things don't work exactly the first time. And It's a lot better because instead of just sitting there talking to someone, you actually get to go and do something and feel better about yourself. You get to express yourself through your gardening. Kevin Williams has seen the power of expressive therapy from the other side. He's a community support worker who leads an art group. You go to a, a traditional therapy session and you're a little guarded. That's, that's human beings being human beings. But if you're sitting around focused on this, having a chat, 
the barriers go down, the walls go down, the sharing starts. The donations will help Stella's Circle expand the expressive therapy program from a few dozen participants to hundreds. Zach Gowdy, CBC News, St. John's. We'll talk about just dropping in for a visit. The Canadian Armed Forces Skyhawks parachute team put on quite a show over the weekend in Conception Bay South, the home of hometown rather of Warrant Officer Mike Dwyer. One, two, check. One, two, check. Look, locate, cutaway, reserve. We have 18 members. Uh, we have a very uh, short training camp of five weeks to get everyone gelled together. Everyone gets to know each other and build a training plan. And we have an amazing group this year. Everyone is uh, getting along, which makes for a great season. Uh, it's a very rewarding career. Obviously, being with the Skyhawks is uh, something a little bit different. But again, I'm very humbled, very honored to be on the team. It's one of the best experiences I've had in my career so far. I'm too nervous to try it myself, but I think it's amazing. I feel pretty honored to be a role model of any type to any young girl who realizes that they can do anything that boys can do. You're from here, you grew up here. How does it feel to parachute down into a rugby field you played on? Words can't describe. Uh, a lot of emotions going on right now, but uh, definitely a highlight of my career to get the parachute into Calgary's where I grew up and I get to show everyone what I've been up to, so it's pretty awesome. And look at the whales. The whales. Have you seen any yet? Yeah, yeah. there's a humpback right out behind you. The whales are here, and tourists on Signal Hill are scrambling to catch a glimpse. And down in St. Vincent's, the show they've been putting on has been spectacular. We'll take you there coming up.
I don't know about you guys, but uh, I got a pretty tough gig out here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out at Cape Spear uh, whale watching, but uh, I heard I heard this weekend quite the show uh, somewhere else on the island. Yeah, absolutely. If you were looking for whales on the weekend, it appears that St. Vincent's was the place to be. Yeah, Gail St. Croix uh, took this, uh, well, actually, uh, yeah, took these shots of the beautiful humpback whales uh, on the Southern Avalon. Well, I'll just interject because these photos were actually posted on Twitter uh, by Jack Lawson, the whale oh, okay. expert. So some great uh, shots taken there. He said that he saw um, a bunch of different whales breaching at least 13 humpbacks feeding on Capelin near the shore. And the great thing is it uh, they're so close. You can get right yeah. up to them. He says it looks like one of the whales breached nine times in a row. Wow. Well, wow. that is amazing. So, any whales out there tonight, Ashley? Yeah, I've been uh, seeing quite a few of them actually. Nothing's nothing's breached yet, but I've seen a few fins uh, here and there. But earlier today, I was also uh, out and about. I went up to Signal Hill to talk to a few people who were enjoying the beautiful weather and also looking for those whales. Take a look. So, where are you guys from? I'm from Newmarket in Ontario. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm from Toronto in Ontario. And what brings you guys to Newfoundland? Vacation. This was on my bucket list. I've always wanted to visit Newfoundland. I was here a couple of years ago and my friend said, I'd like to go to Newfoundland. I said, okay, I'll go with you. <laughs> so I've come back a second time because I loved it so much. Have you guys seen any whales or anything? Yes, we saw a whale that, f that jumped out of the water and landed on his back. We live in Taiwan, so we're here visiting home with some family, and so we're just doing some pictures while we're home, yeah. Is this your first time here? Yeah, it's my first time in Canada. <laughs> so what are you doing in Newfoundland? I'm out here for work. Um, we've been here for about a week. It's absolutely beautiful, stunning. Never seen anything like this before. It's certainly the scenery. Everything we've seen this morning is beautiful. You know, the coastline, the water, it's just beautiful. We're going to start driving around in the next couple of days, so we'll see a lot more. Where are you guys headed next? We're going to Terranova National Park for hiking, and then we're crossing all the way to the other side. We'll be at the Gros Mon. We'll go up to the Viking area. Uh, kids are going to do lots of hikes. Are you going to do any sightseeing while you're sightseeing still? around St. John's? Yeah, we're, well, we're going to go today. We're going to go to Cape Spear. We're going to go down to Kitty Vitty Gut. We're going to... Um, do some other things like that around town, Bowering Park. Let's go for a walk through Bowering Park. Should be nice. Yeah. Um, we went to I forget the name. The the like the most. Yes. There, Cape Spear. That it was absolutely beautiful. Like, it was so mind blowing. Just stepping up and then being like, whoa, there's nothing. <laughs> there's nothing past this. Yeah, it's absolutely beautiful. So the tourists are definitely loving it today for sure. Yeah, and I had uh, some friends who were here from Toronto and on Saturday they went out on the boat tour and this must have been one of the few weekends where you could actually get an iceberg and whales all in the same tour. Normally <laughs> it's hard to get that overlap, but uh, now with these warm temperatures though, Ashley, icebergs aren't going to be kicking around very long. No, nope, not much longer. Uh, certainly an absolutely beautiful weekend for most of the province uh, today as well. If we take a look at some of the temperatures, mid 20 temperatures were your afternoon highs. 23 degrees was the afternoon high in St. John's. Gander 24, 22 in Corner Brook. A little bit cooler up through Labrador, uh, sitting in the mid-teens, but still uh, a pretty beautiful day right now. Hasn't moved much. Still sitting at 23 degrees in St. John's, and those temperatures will uh, drop a little bit as we head through the night tonight, but not by much. Uh, still staying quite nice. So there's a look at the satellite and uh, the satellite this afternoon. You can see nothing but sunshine across uh, the entire uh, island, except up through the northern peninsula. Labrador, you're still socked into some of that cloud cover. We could thank a low pressure system for that. Overall tonight, a beautiful evening. Should be uh, mainly clear skies. Some southwesterlies, a little breezy like what we're seeing right now, 20 to 40 kilometers per hour. And then we still have that potential for some showers moving in, particularly for the southwestern portion. And that's going to move uh, north in the early morning hours, or at least uh, east in the early morning hours. And then up through Labrador, uh, going to stay cloudy with that potential for some rain and those single digit lows 
as your overnight low. So here's a look at tomorrow's forecast. Now that low pressure system that's sitting over Labrador is going to sink a little bit further south. And with some of these warmer temperatures, we are looking at the risk of some thunderstorms. So this is what I'm thinking as far as uh, your thunderstorm activity goes. Generally, the interior and eastern Newfoundland, as well as uh, the northeast coast, could see that risk of thunderstorms in the early morning hours, and then another round will move in through the afternoon. Those temperatures a little bit cooler for some areas, especially through central, but overall you're looking at 23 degrees in St. John's, another absolutely gorgeous day. Winds a little bit stronger than what we're seeing today, so 30 to 50 kilometer per hour winds. Again, that risk of thunderstorms heading towards eastern Newfoundland and then you're going to see the same through uh, central. So 19, 20 degrees is your afternoon high. Showers down through uh, Harbor Breton. And then as we head towards the west coast, uh, 18 degrees it looks like is the number. And uh, the mix of sun and cloud with that potential for some showers as well. Again, it will be in two rounds. Up through the northern peninsula, 13, 14 degrees. A little cooler along the coast. Cartwright sitting around 9 degrees. And then we've got uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay up towards Lab City, still sitting uh, just a little bit above the 10 degree mark and then Nain at seven. But again, gonna stay a little bit unsettled. So we're hanging on to these warmer temperatures today. And then uh, as we head into the day tomorrow, or uh, rather Wednesday, I'll have all those details coming up. Oh, great, thanks Ashley. And Ashley's not the only uh, weather person who likes to get out of the office, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah, the Today Show, which is one of the big TV morning shows in Australia, sent Stevie Jacobs all the way to Newfoundland. In fact, he's been learning a thing or two on Fogo. Take a look. Yes, good morning to you. Let's get it right, right off the head. It's Newfoundland, not Newfoundland, most people pronounce it incorrectly, Newfoundland and Labrador, which is a province that we're in this morning. We're approximately 17,408 kilometres from Sydney this morning. And the idea is just to... Just to beat on it. And just to bash it? OK, yeah. well, I'll bash on this. And you play the spoons. Play the spoons. And this is what it's all about. Go for it. What's amazing about it is we paid a fisherman $1.25 versus 40 cents. So if you go out and you kill fish with nets again, we give you 40 cents. All right, well, listen, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, it's just a fantastic accent that you have here as well. So right. uh, how do you say good morning uh, with a lovely Fogo Island accent? Uh, just good morning. Oh, there, there we go. Yes. <laughs> just good morning, Georgie, Tom <laughs> Amazing. and Mark. I know you love cod. I'll bring some home for you, my friend. <laughs> yeah, well, smoked, preferably. Um, it, it's an it almost sounds Irish. It's like it? yeah, half it's Irish, half yeah. Canadian. Amazing. <laughs> Have you ever had smoked cod? I, I, I know. I was wondering. She's going to be really disappointed yeah, when that shipment yeah, comes back to yeah. her. But um, <laughs> it, it is amusing uh, watching. Australians have a little poke at our accent. Uh, our accent yeah. They don't have an accent at all. No. Nope. <laughs> but I, he said Newfoundland correctly, though. He did. So we'll give him good. points for that. Mm -hmm. Some cabbage. We got lots of onions, carrots, beets, kale. Planting new life in an old facility. Next, see what's growing in Hearts Delight, Islington.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, there's a new Newfoundland pony on the Avalon Peninsula. Meet Salty. The filly was born at a stable in Manuals yesterday, and she came as a bit of a surprise. Belle, the mare, had been overdue, but wasn't showing any signs of labor. And when the owners checked on her yesterday morning, there was Salty by her side. Both mom and baby are doing well. The Newfoundland Pony Society says she's the fourth or fifth new foal this year, helping the endangered breed. There are only about 450 Newfoundland ponies worldwide. Oh, isn't that great? Yeah, isn't that oh, sweet? Cute little. I wonder how long it takes for them to actually get up and, you know, they're, they're no. always so wobbly on those mm -hmm. little stilts little they got. Little bambi legs, yeah. <laughs> Apparently just a few hours for oh, them wow. to get up and, you know, get on the go. Lovely. There we go. <laughs> Well, people in the town of Hearts Delight Islington are finding a new use for an old outdoor swimming pool. And they're not swimming. The CBC's Francesca Swan has this look at the ideas that's been planned. Joanne Ryan from the 50 Plus Club is the instigator of the garden and she was digging a trench when I spoke with her. What prompted you to get this garden underway? We wanted to set up a garden where we could increase the physical, mental and social well-being of all, all the seniors here in Arts Delight. We had about a 95% in favour of starting a community garden. Because I think a lot of people can see the benefit of it, you know? It's a, a very social thing. People come together, we have a good time. Tell me, i get the water for you. Okay. We all designed what we wanted to put in the garden and how it was laid out. In-ground crops like this is for people, you know, that's more able-bodied that can get out and do it. Those raised barrels is for older people that got mobility issues and uh, things like that. How can gardening help in so many ways? Well, it's the physical part of it. We're getting our exercise. We're getting the sunshine. We're getting all the, the healthy crops that we're growing. We're, all, we're doing this all, all organically. This morning now we just put in some collard seedlings, some cabbage. We got lots of onions, carrots, beets, kale. It's better when the knives are out of it. Just like making cookies. How many people in the 50 plus club, Joanne? There's uh, approximately 52 right now. And how much know-how was in the group about gardening when they uh, started? When we, we talked about it, I said, now who here got gardening experience? and probably about five or six people put their hands up. But they were all willing to try anyway, and that's the main thing. So there's a learning curve. What was the most common mistake that people were making when they were putting in the garden? Oh, overplanting, <laughs> putting too many seeds in. Good, good answer, Joanne. Yeah. Right now, you see, we're basically catering to our 50 plus and, and a few uh, other seniors like in the community. But like if we get a lot of interest, we're hoping to maybe put in uh, an application for some Crown Land so we can extend and open it up to the whole community. Because I think it's important for the young people to get involved in this sort of thing. Because they don't know anything about it. They don't know where their food comes from, but I think, I think it's important that we teach them. Tell me about the support you've had from the town of Hearts Delight, Islington. Oh, we've had quite a bit of support, uh, you know, from, from the town. When, when we came up with this idea, me and another guy from the 50 plus went to, attended one of the, the, the meetings from the town and uh, presented our proposal and they were right on board with us. They donated this land, the recreation owned the fence, so they left the fence there for us. We were actually delighted that, uh, that they took this initiative to, uh, to develop this community garden. Uh, community gardens are, are starting to crop up all over Newfoundland and Labrador now. They selected this site because it was an abandoned site, so to speak, for the past 15, 20 years. And there was a lot of homework had to be done on it, a lot of clearing away, and the town council helped them out with that because we have a water treatment plant. We have barrels coming in all the time. So they started out and they got some topsaw delivered and we put it in the pool and helped them out that way. So the town was very supportive of this. And for any other community, thinking of putting in a community garden, what would your message be to them? I would say go ahead and give it a try, even though, even if you've got no experience. I mean, people come together and 
and work at it. And uh, yes, it, and it's a worthwhile cause. Well, uh, I'm outside enjoying this absolutely gorgeous evening tonight at Cape Spear, whale watching. Now, is this weather going to stick around as we head towards midweek? I'll have all those details coming up. Well, before we get to the weather, Ashley, you had quite an exciting weekend on the water, didn't you? I had probably my most favorite weekend so far uh, since moving here, and I hope that uh, I'm going to continue to get weekends like this. But I went cod fishing for the very first time, and I was pretty lucky. I believe we have a, a photo of that. I, uh, Fish and that a was lobster. legitimately the first one that I pulled out of the water, and... Uh, yeah, and a lot. The lobster was given to me. I didn't. Uh, I didn't get that, obviously. But uh, yeah, an absolutely, um, absolutely wonderful afternoon. <laughs> and then cooked it up yesterday, and boy, was it delicious. And I can attest to that because I did get to share in some of Ashley's uh, fish. She cooked it up there with uh, some scrunchions and a bit of flour and some seasoning. And uh, you did a really good job, Ashley. Yep. I must say. <laughs> My invitation must have been uh, lost in the mail. <laughs> For my first we didn't want to share. <laughs> don't blame you. Yeah, no, but don't worry. Don't worry, Peter. I have lots. It's all good. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to we're going to chat about uh, what's going to happen in the next couple of days because, uh, you know, an absolutely gorgeous day today. We'll take a look one more time at uh, the temperature right now. St. John sitting at 22 degrees and we've got that cooler air up through Labrador only sitting at 10 right now. But uh, tomorrow we're going to continue to see those warmer temperatures, especially for the Avalon should reach a high near 23 degrees for St. John's cooler as we head towards central, not by much, but still a couple of degrees cooler and that risk of thunderstorms again through the afternoon up through Labrador, still under the influence of that low pressure system. So cooler temperatures and rain on tap for you tomorrow. Now, as we uh, move into Wednesday, 
We are uh, going to see that low spin offshore just a little bit. So we're going to get back into an onshore flow, which is going to cool some of those temperatures down. And it's looking a little bit rainy, especially along the northeast coast for Wednesday. Eventually, Labrador, Lab West anyway, will clear out. And we'll see as that low continues to track a little bit further south and a little bit more offshore, that rain should pull right along with it. So here's a look at your temperatures for your Wednesday, 16 degrees. So there's that dip uh, in those temperatures a little bit below seasonal for this time of year with that potential for showers uh, right across the board essentially. And then uh, up through Labrador, still seven degrees for Cartwright. So you're gonna stay cool with that onshore flow. Nain looks beautiful though, sunshine and 13 degrees. And then Lab City looking at sunshine and 16. Now uh, that's what we're looking at for Wednesday. Thursday, things are gonna calm down a little bit again. And then uh, we're in for a little bit of some rain as we head towards the weekend. So certainly get out and enjoy the weather right now. Uh, if you can get out to Cape Spear, the, uh, they are getting quite active. We're seeing quite a bit more whales uh, out here tonight and uh, hopefully that will continue. So I'm gonna go do that and I'm gonna throw it back to you guys uh, in the studio. Thanks, Ashley. Not impressed. <laughs> Well, in national news, Jason Kenney is hosting a select group of fellow premiers today in Alberta before they meet with the rest of the premiers tomorrow in Saskatchewan. The words like-minded come up several times when describing the five men. A number of us have differences of opinion, strong differences of opinion with the direction of the federal government and the way it's damaged particular resource industries. Many of us have differences with the federal government on the carbon tax, which, uh, we'll be, which we talked about today. None of us, nor do our citizens, appreciate a message that it's either Ottawa's way or the highway. While Kenny was joined by New Brunswick, Blaine Higgs, Ontario's Doug Ford, Saskatchewan's Scott Moe, and the Northwest Territories' Bob McLeod. Earlier, they attended the Calgary Stampede Pancake Breakfast and were all given white hats and Stampede belt buckles. Mo will host the All Premiers meeting from Tuesday until Thursday. A trove of documents is shedding light on how Canada's spy agency monitored protest groups. BC's Civil Liberties Association fought to have the documents released. It maintains CSIS is overstepping its legal authority. This all amounts to a shocking violation of free expression. We won the right to disclose these documents today after a fight. And we're going to continue to challenge the findings and the gag orders in federal court. The Civil Liberties Group filed a complaint with the body that oversees CSIS back in 2014. It alleges the spy service was monitoring environmentalists opposed to the Northern Gateway Pipeline proposal. The group accused CSIS of sharing information with the National Energy Board and petroleum companies. The Security Intelligence Review Committee dismissed the complaint. The Civil Liberties Group is asking the federal court to revisit that decision. CSIS insists it acted properly and its actions were reasonable and necessary. Now to the United States where high profile financier Jeffrey Epstein has been charged with sex trafficking. He's in police custody in New York accused of paying girls as young as 14 for sex. The crimes allegedly took place in New York and Florida between 2002 and 2005. Officials outlined the allegations against him this morning. As alleged, Epstein was well aware that many of his victims were minors. And not surprisingly, many of the underage girls that Epstein allegedly victimized were particularly vulnerable to exploitation. The alleged behavior shocks the conscience. Officials accuse Epstein of paying girls hundreds of dollars each for sex during naked massages and using them to recruit other underage girls, luring them into his homes in Manhattan and Palm Beach. Epstein is 66 years old. He faces a maximum sentence of 45 years in prison if he's convicted. What's really cool when you come to these shows is you get to see how vehicles have evolved over all the years. Classic cars were packed into a parking lot in St. John's this weekend. We'll take you to the Hickman Car and Bike Show coming up.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, you know, it's summer when hundreds of classic cars are rolled out of storage to be showcased at the 24th annual Hickman Car and Bike Show on Kemmont Road. Some competitors have been showing up almost religiously for 20 years. Others aren't even 20 years old. Have a look. We are celebrating the uh, automobile and motorcycle. You know, we've been doing this now for 24 years, our 24th annual uh, car and bike show. We started off 24 years ago with just a few Corvettes for uh, display, and today we've probably got over 250 uh, automobiles and motorcycles on display. One day a year that I enjoy doing something, and there's probably there's other people here coming just as long or just that, but I've been coming here a long while, and I've enjoyed every year that I've come here. You're supposed to be at work now, aren't you? Yep. But I'm on annual leave. <laughs> well, you know, uh, this is our uh, family business, so we've grown up around uh, automobiles and uh, certainly motorcycles, and uh, we're car collectors, and there's a passion about car collectors, and there's a lot of uh, family uh, that, uh, that really thrive about collecting and viewing cars. You can see all the young people and old people that are here today. You know, lots of people talk about the car their mom or dad used to have, their grandfather, Cars they used to have when they were younger, they've had the chance to buy them again and bring them out. And so you talk about seeing grandchildren of the people that are here. You know, what's really cool when you come to these shows is you get to see how vehicles have evolved over all the years. And you look at this particular vehicle, it's 54 Chev pickup, and then if you look to 1986, so uh, 32 years later, and how the styling has changed. And then if you fast forward again to today, and again how it's changed. But to see something like this, Many people remember that, you know, when they were young, their mom and dad probably had one of those cars, and that's how they went camping on the weekends. It's lovely how people restore them and bring them back to what they used to be. So many memories. Well, some people like to collect cars. Others, it's hockey memorabilia. The Newfoundland Growlers sold off their jerseys right off their back this weekend. Fans of the ECHL champions lined up for a locker room sale, hoping to nab their very own piece of hockey history. We're here for our uh, annual locker room sale with the Newfoundland Growlers. Uh, as a chance for fans to come down and get some discounted merchandise from our store and also a chance to own some game use equipment and some uh, extra brand new equipment that we had during the season. Uh, lots of sticks, gloves, uh, helmets, lots of things from our historic first year. And uh, yeah, just a real, uh, real opportunity for fans to come down and be another part of the Growlers. Uh, we watched the Growlers play a lot of hockey. And what do you think you're going to get today? Um, Maybe a jersey, it depends on the budget. How happy are you right now? <laughs> yeah, a lot of these fans we've seen throughout the season down here at Mile One cheering on the Growlers, so to see them on a Saturday afternoon and uh, getting a piece of uh, the Growlers history, it's, it's a pretty neat thing to see. The buzz in the city uh, during the playoffs, during the finals was incredible. Uh, that's kind of carried over into the summer. There's been a real good response to our uh, season tickets. Uh, renewals have been strong. Uh, some new season tickets being purchased as well. And uh, the buzz has just been real positive here for the, uh, over the summer and certainly the playoffs and winning a championship here on home ice was a big part of that. Well, throughout the show, we've been talking about tourism. Well, Whistler, B.C. draws millions of visitors every year, and local restaurants are eager to accommodate them. But it hasn't been easy because they've been dealing with severe staffing shortages, and that prompted one recruiter to look for qualified workers overseas, chefs from Morocco. The CBC's Mickey Cowan has more. It's a dream come true for Moroccan Noel bin Zakri. I was shocked. <laughs> <laughs> and I was so happy. <laughs> oh, wow, I will go to Canada, no way. Vince Cree sent her resume to a recruitment company in Whistler just a few months ago. Fast forward to today, and she's working as a chef at the Fairmont Chateau Whistler. It's difficult, but I can make a career here faster than in Morocco. Ben Zakri is just one of around 50 chefs now cooking up careers in the skier's paradise. The Barefoot Bistro says it's a constant struggle to find enough workers, hiring 10 to 12 new people every season. Many restaurants cut hours due to staff shortages, so having steady workers is a sigh of relief. It's been great having them, and also because it's more long-term so we know that they're with us for a while. Joel Chevalier worked in the industry for years and saw the shortage firsthand. So when he traveled to Morocco on a trip, a light bulb went on. 
uh, Morocco has been a real great hotbed for tourism, and so it's filled with, uh, with Western restaurant styles and hotels, uh, and so people have been trained really well. Since September, Chevalier has been connecting cooks with more than a dozen restaurants in Whistler, all looking for experienced chefs willing to stick around. Then he helps them apply for two-year work visas with Ottawa's Francophone Mobility Program, designed to bring in French-speaking, skilled workers. Uh, there's a lot of young, talented chefs that are really interested in trying a new life in Canada. Workers can stay for two to four years under the visa program, an eternity for the worker-deprived restaurant industry. They're kind of locked in for two years, which gives us a little bit more stability. Although not all of them want to leave when the time comes. During this four months, I, I decide to stay here forever. The demand for Moroccan chef recruitments is expanding beyond Whistler, too. Next week, Chevalier will head back overseas and hire up to 40 more. Mickey Cowan, CBC News, Vancouver. Welcome back, everyone. Well, whales have certainly been the talk of the town lately, but there's another sighting on the water that's also getting some attention. Yeah, if you've been in the St. John's Harbor, you may have noticed a fancy yacht docked there. This is Sakara 5, a 223-foot luxury charter yacht built in 2010 and refitted just two years ago. Wow, that is something. It can seat a uh, seat. It can sleep 12 guests in six separate cabins and can carry a crew of 18 people. The yacht also has a deck jacuzzi, a gym, a massage room, an all access elevator and four bars. Yeah, you can rent the boat in the summer for about, uh, get this, $730,000 wow. a week. <laughs> Plus expenses. Plus expenses. Yeah, that doesn't include your fuel. 
Oh, and you probably want to eat something on board. Yeah, yeah. There's going to be extra cost for the food there as well. So seven hundred and thirty thousand dollars a week. That's yes, for, I, I don't think if we pooled all of our money here at CBC no. for an entire year, we could afford a week <laughs> on that ship. So, but well, somebody is, and they're enjoying they it. They certainly are. Well, here's another way to see the sights. Yeah, it's the latest version of the Fast and the Furious in the booming adventure tourism. Croatia now offers Europe's longest zip line. Very scary at the first, with your head head to first. But after 20 meters, it was just amazing. The zip line runs 1,700 meters from the mountains down through the hills. Locals say the bravest riders can zip along at 120 kilometers an hour. Wow. That is. How do you terrifying. stop? That's the. I don't show anyone stopping. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, that wraps up this uh, edition of Here and Now. Uh, Ashley will be back in the studio tomorrow. And I'm going to go out and join her and enjoy this yes. nice weather. Have a great night, everyone.